Okay, so where we started out last time was autoregressive processes. And that's just a fancy name for talking about how to model kind of where a signal comes from, right? And so in signal systems, for example, we never really thought about where the real world signals that we were dealing with might have come from. And so oftentimes what you do is you model the signal, okay, with a simple model that tells me how to obtain the current signal value. And so a very common model is what's called an autoregressive process. And that's basically saying that the current value of the signal is related to a set of previous values of the signal. And so I kind of specify how many of those previous values I want to consider. And then I have some extra noise where that noise tells me that my um, that noise tells me that my uh, prediction is not always 100% correct, right? But this is not actually that unusual, right? So for example, it's not unusual to imagine that I could predict, for example, you know, the weather this hour from what the weather has been doing in the past four hours, right? So there's some notion that real world processes depend on previous values of the process, right? And what Dr. Tajer was talking about in his lecture in the last time was how do I kind of make a good estimate of what should these values be if I'm given real data? And this noise also kind of tells me how off am I in my estimate, right? And so we talked about um, I have a estimate of the square of the noise. That's like, I assume that this noise is zero mean and it has some variance. And then I have some other information that's basically saying, how do I expect x of n and x of n minus k to be related to each other? And that expectation is represented by a function that we called r. That was called the autocorrelation matrix, right? And so this R, we denote that R sub K. And then, hopefully at the end of the lecture, what we ended up with was a big matrix equation that said, okay, if I want to estimate these quantities, I solve an equation that looks like this. And so I build this big matrix. Whoops. Yeah. I build this big matrix out of all these autocorrelation values. Sorry, I can give, didn't give myself a lot of room here to do this. But basically, I end up with something where if I know how I expect different values of the signal at different times to be related to each other, I can put all those R values into this matrix and solve this matrix equation, that gives me the optimal set of autoregressive coefficients. Okay? And so, again, since I know many of you took probability with me, we talked about these kinds of things. right? So if I want to look at the, this is kind of like looking at the uh, covariance of these two random values. right? So I think about every x value as being something random because there's noise involved in it. And this is kind of like a matrix that collects all those covariances together. Okay. And so these were called the Yule-Walker equations. Now, when I know everything about the process in terms of um, you know, a statistical representation of the process, then I could get those R's kind of computationally. In practice, how would I estimate what those autocorrelations are? Well, what I would do is I would um, you know, if I was estimating the k autocorrelation from data, you know, x1 all the way to x, you know, some big number, what I would do would be simply to take the average of, you know, however many numbers I have. Right, so this would be like actually taking real data and I'd be taking the average. I guess here I would need to have actually a little bit more 
well, this is okay. You kind of know what I mean. In fact, I only have n minus k numbers in this sum. So I'd have to do something like, yeah, this, this is okay for the moment. All, all I'm saying is you basically take the sample average of saying, okay, if I wanted to estimate r of zero, I would just look at the average sum of squares, right? If I look at, wanted to look at r of one, I would say I, I sum up x of two times x of one, plus x of three times x of two, plus x of four times x of three. That's kind of like getting the sample autocorrelation, right? Just in the same way that if I wanted to estimate the mean, I would look at the average of the values, right? We talked about that a little bit in probability also. Okay, and so that's kind of where we hopefully ended up last time. Let me just see, does that sound kind of familiar from last time? Okay, all right, so this autoregressive model is very common in DSP. And so now what I want to talk about, if I can find the page of notes that contains what I want to talk about, is a particular problem called Wiener filtering, okay? So today, we're gonna to talk about what are called Wiener filters. And so a fancier word for these are optimum or optimal linear discrete time filters. And so, what do I mean by optimal? So here, what I want to do is I want to design a filter that does kind of provably as well as possible at doing a certain job, okay? So typically, you know, here's a kind of filtering situation. And the setup is basically that this is a, you know, now we're gonna treat this as kind of some sort of random process, meaning that I don't know exactly what's coming to the system. I have a, maybe a model for what's coming to the system, but there may be some noise in that model. So this is not entirely predictable. That means that this system is gonna filter this random thing, and then this is also gonna be some sort of a you know, random output. And the goal is to design the filter H to drive the output to a desired output, let's call that D of n. So there will be error between what I want and what I get, and we want to minimize this in a statistical sense. Right? So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, so, what is, so to make this a little more concrete, what is an example of a desired signal that I might want? So a very common thing to want to do is to predict the next value of the signal, okay? So for example, I might say I'm gonna take in all the stuff I've gotten so far, and I wanna predict the next value. Right, so in that case, the desired value is x of n plus one, for example. Right, take everything I've seen so far, I try and guess what comes next. Or you might think about this as kind of a uh, smoothing process, right? Where instead of predicting the next value, I want to predict, well, predict is a kind of weird word, I want to estimate some previous value. That's kind of like saying, well, if I know that all of the values are kind of correlated with each other, that after I see enough previous data, I should be able to do a, a pretty good job of estimating x of five based on, for example, you know, x of one through x of 10, right? I should know that all those values are kind of coupled together, and so my exact observation of x of five that was kind of noisy, maybe I could do better by looking at all the values around it and getting a better estimate of x of five, right? So usually in this case, what I'm gonna talk about today is when the desired signal is really one of the previous values of x, or one of the future values of x, right? So this comes up an awful lot. Okay, and so what do I mean by minimizing this error? Well, we kind of want to minimize this in a probabilistic way. For example, we want to minimize the expected value of the square of this error. We want that, to, that expected value to be as low as possible, right? And so now you're kind of seeing that actually to really get into deeper DSP, you need to combine you know, signal systems with probability, right? So those two courses are kind of starting to come together into the last chunk of this course where we're talking about input signals that are not deterministic, okay? Okay. 
So what does the filter do, right? So here's my output. What the filter does, let's imagine this is some sort of infinite impulse response causal filter. It applies these filter coefficients to all the previous values of x, right? So we're going to imagine this is an IIR causal filter. And just for bookkeeping, we're going to assume that x of n and the desired signal are what are called zero mean wide sense stationary. So you should already know what zero mean is, and we and Dr. Tajer should have mentioned about what wide sense stationary was last time. Basically, that just means that the statistics of the signal don't move around as a function of time. It's kind of like saying that the you know correlation, the autocorrelation, is time invariant. Right? Another application of time invariance is basically saying that you know the fundamental inherent properties of the signal are not changing around from time one to time two. Okay, and so we want to minimize. what I'm going to call this function j, which is the expected value of the error squared. Okay. And in this case, I mean, even though you can talk about all this when the filter and the signals are all complex <coughs> variables, I'm going to try and do this all with real variables today to make the notation a little bit easier. Um, even though my notes are in complex, so I may have to kind of do some on the fly retargeting in my notes to kind of make sure that I'm giving you the right stuff. Okay, so let me just stop and ask comments and questions about this so far. So let me just make a note that says, you know, D of N um, is likely a, you know, past or a future value of X of N. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more after I develop the theory. We'll then make it specific to certain, you know, specific desired functions. Okay. And so we're going to want to minimize this over the, you know, filter coefficients. Okay. And so how do we, you know, minimize something? Well, we take the derivative with respect to each of those things and say it equal to zero, right? In this case, we have a whole bunch of things that we have to take the derivative of. So we're actually taking the gradient of this function and say it equal to zero. So again, this is kind of like what you did in multivariable calculus was, you know, taking the gradient and say it equal to zero. So let's kind of follow that road and see where we get. So to minimize j as a function of the hk elements, we take the derivative and say it equal to zero. And so, really, here the derivative is the gradient because the gradient is the multidimensional one. And so, the kind of derivative of j with respect to the hk guy is what we're going to set equal zero for each of the filter coefficients. Okay. And so, now let's actually compute what would be that derivative, right? So j is the expected value of this thing squared, OK? So the derivative of j with respect to this thing by the chain rule is going to be the expected value of 2 e of n, the derivative of e of n with respect to hk. Right? So I take 2 times this thing, and I take the derivative of the inside with respect to the thing I'm taking the, taking the uh, partial of, right? So this is just the chain rule. And so now I have to remember what is my E of n. I have to figure out what is that E of n in order to take the derivative. Well, since E of n is the desired thing minus what I got, 
And what I got is this guy here. <coughs> so here I should be able to see that what is the derivative of this with respect to a given filter coefficient? Well, it's exactly the thing that multiplies x of n minus k, right? So if I want to know what is the derivative with respect to h of 2, well, it's x of n minus 2, right? So the derivative. And again, just a reminder, this, this squirrely 2 here, this is actually a, a partial derivative. So you have to kind of excuse my difference between this and 2, right? So here I can see that the derivative is just x of n minus k. And so that means that the derivative of j with respect to hk is uh, basically, I guess there's a minus sign here, right? because there's a minus sign here. So it's basically the expected value of minus 2 x of n, x of, oh, I'm sorry, e of n, x of n minus k. And I can take out the minus 2 part. And so here, I'm not done yet. This is just kind of a quick note that says that the error at time n, so I want to set this equal to 0 for things to be optimal, right? And so this here is basically saying that the error e of n is orthogonal to all the inputs, x of n, x of n minus 1, and so on. That's just a way of saying that, you know, here what I'm doing is I'm setting up a set of equations that have to be satisfied. So here I have to substitute some more stuff in here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in what do I know about e of n? Well, I know it's equal to this thing here, okay? So now I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to say that my partial that I have to set equal to 0 is equal to minus 2 expected value. I'm just rewriting what I had in the previous slide. Now what do I know about this E of n? Well, it's basically desired thing minus this set of filter coefficients, the filtering the signal, times this thing here. And here I'm just going to be a little bit careful, actually. I think that what I should do is make this an i. So let me just, so here's a common student mistake, and I'm going to fix it here, because the thing that notice is that I was, I was starting to write it like this, but the thing to realize is that here, this k is not the same as this k, right? So here, this is saying I specifically want to know about the k filter coefficient, and that's related to the delay in the signal by k, right? However, this k and this sum is just a dummy variable that I'm summing over, right? This could be i or j or whatever. It's important when you do this kind of work to make sure that you keep in mind you're, you know, you might you don't mix up these two things. So what I should do is say something like this. I'm just going to keep this here. What I should do is say the partial with respect to j. So same thing here. Now I'm going to just write this dummy variable with an i to make sure I don't get confused any more than I already am. OK. That's better, because this makes it clearer that what I have is something that's a dummy and something that's dependent on the value of k that I want. And now I'm going to expand this out. I'm going to have minus 2 expected value of this thing minus at this point, you know, to be honest, I can get rid of the minus 2. I'm going to set this thing equal to 0 anyway, so I'm just going to scratch that guy up. And then I have this sum, 
So here, these things are not random, so I can take out this thing. And so kind of what you can see here is that this is starting to look like something that we remember from the last lecture. And this on the other side is something that kind of looks like the covariance between one of the signal values and the desired value, whatever I want, right? So I can write this in slightly more compact form. I can say that I have, I'm going to move this over to the other side. I'm going to say I have this. And now this is what I called the autocorrelation function of the signal. And the autocorrelation function only depends on the distance between these two points in time, right? So this was taken at n minus i, this was taken at n minus k, so the autocorrelation is at i minus k. And then I'm going to call this thing on the other side p of minus k, where I define p of minus k as its expected value. So again, as we're going to talk about in just a second, if d is a different value of the very same signal, then this also turns into one of the autocorrelation numbers. If it's not, if it's some other signal that may be related to x of k but is not exactly x, then this is going to be just some other kind of correlation function. Okay. But this guy here kind of tells me, OK, so if I want optimality, I have to get the filter coefficients to satisfy this kind of simultaneous set of equations. And these are called the wiener hopf equations. So this is a little bit tough to handle when I'm talking about an IIR filter, right? When I have an IIR filter, I have an infinite number of H's that need to be estimated here. So I've got kind of like an infinite number of equations and an infinite number of unknowns. So that's not so good. But life is a lot easier when I specify to say, OK, I'm going to only allow myself to deal with an FIR filter, right? So that makes life easier. So if we only consider a length m FIR filter, then the wiener hopf equations become a little bit simpler. So that means I only have m values here to worry about. And actually, this looks pretty similar to the Yule Walker equations that we talked about on Thursday, right? Where I'm estimating the parameters of the autoregressive process. This is almost exactly the same kind of thing, because if I write this in a matrix form, what I get is here, let's suppose I'm trying to estimate you know, h0, h1, through hm minus 1. So what is this guy going to be? Well, what is multiplying uh, h0? Well, what's multiplying h0 is, so, for, so the first thing, let's, let's just say that you know, for uh, k equals 0, then that means this is 0. And it means I have a system of equations that looks like um, r0 multiplying h0, r1 multiplying here, r2, and so on. When I look at the next filter coefficient, k equals 1, then what I have is a set of numbers like this. And I can see that this R matrix is going to be exactly the same R that I got in my Yule Walker equations. And on the right hand side, these guys are just going to be some other numbers that come from autocorrelations. And so I can write this in a much more compact way. That's like saying r h equals p, where 
this is the same autocorrelation matrix from Yule Walker. These are the optimal uh, filter coefficients or filter taps. And these guys are just some other, you know, other kind of correlations between the signal that I have and the signal that I want. Okay. And then again, I would solve this very easily just by taking the inverse. I could say that H is R inverse of P, or in MATLAB I would say R backslash P, right? Either way, that would give me the optimal filter coefficients, and then I would be done. Okay. Okay. So let me just pause and ask for a second. Any questions about where we're going or where we got so far? Okay. So let's take a minute and think about how well we can do with this approach, right? So kind of one thing I'm interested in is, you know, how low is my error when I solve this problem, right? So let's suppose that I've solved this, right? I've gotten my optimal coefficients in this way. And now let's look back at what is the you know, let's revisit this j, which is the expected value of my error squared, okay? So now I know what these optimal things are. So let me just kind of write out what I get. So here, this is like saying I had the expected value of the desired thing minus the filtered guy. And again, just so I don't get myself in trouble, maybe what I should have done is, let me just write this in a slightly different way, to make it clear that the k in the first sum and the k in the second sum are not the same k. So I should write it like this. This would probably be better. Okay, so now let me start multiplying stuff out here. So what I'm going to get is I have an expected value of d of n squared minus, here I've got this bunch of stuff here. I'm going to have the sum of h of k times the expected value of this guy. And then I'm going to have actually two of these guys, um, one from here and one from here. And then I'm going to have plus a double sum of these guys times the expected value of this thing. And here I should be able to see that these things are all going to be basically related to the pieces that went into the optimal filter. And so what I should be able to do is I can say, okay, I'm going to give this guy a special name. I'm just going to call that the variance of my desired process. Here, what I have is fundamentally this thing here, I gave that a name too. I gave that a name of P, right? So what I have here is actually in matrix form or vector form, just two H transpose P. And then what I have here is basically this thing. These are like the autocorrelation guys. And this is nothing more than a matrix product that looks like H transpose R H. Okay. So all I did here was just an exercise in converting a set of you know equations that look nasty into a set of vector and matrix equations. Right? This is a scalar. This is a scalar. It's just a dot product of these vectors. This is also a scalar where this is a column vector, this is a row vector, and so when I multiply them together, I get a scalar again. Okay. And so this is basically the error that I get for any 
H that I might choose. Okay. And now let's talk about the specific H that I know is the best. Okay. So let me call that H hat. So at the optimal H, which I'm going to call H hat, we discover that that was basically R inverse of this vector P. And so my optimal J is going to be this guy. And now I'm going to plug in what do I know about this. This is 2 R inverse P transpose P plus R inverse P transpose R R inverse P. Now I'm going to kind of make sure I get this right. 2 P transpose R inverse P plus P transpose R inverse R R inverse P. So these guys are going to cancel out. And I can see that what I get is sigma D squared minus, and these guys are the same thing. So I get sigma D squared minus P transpose R inverse Okay, and so this tells me this is the best error that I can get, and it depends on the variance of my uh, desired signal, and it depends on these various correlations between different signal parts. Okay, and if I look back and I compare this to this, what I could do is I could say, okay, well that means that um, I can show. that for any h, it's equal to this thing that I just computed. So what I want to do is I want to say, uh, actually, let me just write this like this. This is my value for a generic value of h. And I can say that's equal to this thing, which is what I just derived. This is my j hat plus this thing. And what I end up with is that I get j hat plus this. So what this means is that you know, this is the error for any H. This is the error for the optimal H. And this is going to be some positive number because R is a positive definite matrix. All this means is that what I've shown is that I can kind of tell from this equation that I can't do any better than this error because this is some positive number. And the only way that I can hit this error exactly is if my filter is exactly the optimal filter. right? So it's kind of a different way of proving the minimality of the optimal filter. So I can see that this optimal filter is unique, right? Because the only way I can get this thing to be equal to 0 is if this number here is equal to 0. So this tells me that the optimal filter is unique. OK. And so I'm not going to talk about it today, but I will talk about it a little bit more next time in terms of how do I arrive at this H. So here I basically have a closed form solution. If I say I want an MTAP optimal linear filter, I could just crank through these Wienerhoff equations and solve them, right? It turns out that there are some more efficient ways of getting those filter taps than just solving this potentially large matrix equation. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, next time. But what I want to do now is make this a little more specific to say, okay, well, you know, suppose this desired signal is actually one of the original input signal values, right? I'm trying to estimate, for example, a future value of H. So how does that work? 
So here's a special case. So an important special case of all this is what I would call linear prediction. And this is a concept that really runs throughout a lot of advanced DSP. Okay? I've got a bunch of single values. I want to predict the next one. Okay? So that's like saying we want to, for example, predict x of n from, say, up to m previous values of x. And so what we're going to do is assume, for example, what we call a one step forward linear predictor. That is, that I'm going to predict a value of x of n from some combination of previous values of x. Okay? And I want to figure out what is the optimal set of filter taps that gives me the best prediction of x. Okay? And you can see this falls right into the category of what we just talked about, where the desired signal is actually you know, one of the original filter values. Okay? And so, actually, maybe I should, um, so this is, this corresponds to, you know, D of M is X of N plus one, basically. So it's like saying, I take all the stuff that happened just before my signal, and I want to predict the next one, right? Because this sum is only going from 1 to m. And so let me just make a quick note. So if d of n is equal to x of n, that's what we call a filtering problem. If d of n is x of n plus some positive number, <coughs> that's what we call a prediction problem. And if d of n is x of n minus some positive number, that's what we call a smoothing problem. Right? So this is like saying that if, you know, depending on which kind of value of x, present, future, or past, I have different names for those problems, right? Most of the time we're interested in prediction, but as I said in the earlier part of the class, I can also think about trying to refine my estimate of a previous value that I saw by looking at all the values that have happened since, right? So I can kind of try and use those correlations to smooth out noise that may have been present in the signal, right? And so right now we're kind of in this world here, okay? And so here, this is like saying, um, you know, for, uh, one step ahead prediction. We can find the answer with a Wiener filter. Okay. And so, what is the setup? Well, here the setup is that we have uh, the desired signal oh, brain freeze. Yes, okay. So here, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that the way I set this problem up is kind of one uh, so here the way I wrote this is a little bit funky. So I guess you could argue that this is like saying that I want this desired signal to be this, but I'm only using previous values. So I could kind of write this in a slightly different way to say that I want um, x of n to be equal to the sum k equals 0 to m minus 1 of h of k x of n minus k. Right? So 
since everything is kind of stationary, that, that's okay. It's like basically saying that I want to predict the future value of x from these guys. Okay. In my notes, I have it a little bit funky, but that's okay. So here what I'm saying is um, I have the desired value of n is going to be a future value of x, and the error at time n is going to be x of n plus 1 minus the prediction of this. So in some sense, the error has to look into the future to be able to tell me how good I am. And I want to minimize what I call this error function j, which is the expected value of the error at time n squared. So now, let's go back and look at what we would need to set up this problem, right? The Wiener-Hopf equations require that I have the autocorrelation matrix and this p. And let's go back and remember what we defined p as. This was the expected value of x of n minus k times what I want to predict. And what I want to predict here is basically x of n plus 1. So if I set up these matrix equations, what I have is something like this. using m previous values. Okay. And what I'm trying to predict are my desired filter taps. And my p's turn out to be basically other values of autocorrelations, right? Because here what I'm doing is I'm looking at the lag between the kth value of x and the n plus first value of x, right? And so if I put in k equals 0, what I have is this lag. I'm off by 1. If I put in k equals 1, I have a lag where I'm off by 2. If I put in k equals uh, m minus 1, I have a lag where I'm off by m, right? So now all of these guys here are just values in the autocorrelation that I could get from the original description of the signal. And so this is the kind of Wiener-Hoff equation for a one step ahead prediction. So let me just stop and ask if there are any questions about that. You'll see on the exam, the practice exam, that there's a problem like this in the last problem in the exam, I think, where I say, OK, here are a bunch of autocorrelations for the signal. Now tell me what would be the equations that you would have to set up for a one-step-ahead predictor. Maybe it's a two-step-ahead predictor, something like that. So basically, the idea is you look at this table of autocorrelation values, and you set up for me a linear system like this. You don't have to solve it, but you have to show me that you understand what numbers go in here and what numbers go in there. right? So that's the kind of question I can ask you about linear filtering on an exam, where I don't ask you to solve it, but I ask you to set it up for me. Okay. And now I can think about, OK, so how would I find out what is my best error? Okay. So how, how am I doing with my error? So the minimum error, so the error for the optimal h hat. So if you look back at what we did, we showed that the error is given by this guy. Now, this p is actually Again, a set of autocorrelations. And this guy here is just defined as 
you know, this, this is the same thing as the expected value of x of n plus 1 squared. And that has a name. That's just the autocorrelation at 0, right? That's like saying, what is the variance of x at each point? So I can say that here, what I have is r0 minus and uh, what do I get confused here? So why is that true? So my, here what I'm doing is I, I guess I define this r. I guess I call this r because it's full of little r's, right? Here I'm just writing this in such a way that depends on r's totally. And that's because this here is exactly my h hat. And so what I, the reason I'm doing this is I can say that I can actually write down the equations I need to solve to get both the optimal filter and the actual value of the expected error in one shot, right? So if I write this in this way, what I can do is I can say I've got my big matrix R. So here's kind of a slick way of writing this. So here, this is kind of like a m plus 1 by m plus 1 matrix. And if I write out what each of these systems means, the top system tells me I have r0 plus r transpose h hat equals j hat. I guess I have to make this like this. Right? This tells me, here's how I get the uh, best error that I can do. And then here, I have r plus r h hat equals 0, or r minus r h hat equals 0. And this tells me that my h hat is equal to r inverse r. And so the idea is that here, this is something where I can kind of simultaneously get the best filter and the best error in kind of one matrix equation put together. And the way I think about this is, this is actually just a much bigger um, all the correlation matrix, right? And so where I'm going with this is that, okay, so let me just stop and, and tell you why I'm doing this. So where I want to go next to finish up this lecture is to say, okay, you know, suppose that I had a, you know, m tap one step forward predictor, okay, and then I told you, okay, I can give you one more tap, right? I can I can let you look one more element into the past to help me predict things, right? Can I obtain my next best filter by using the filter I already have and just kind of updating it a little bit, right? So instead of having to solve this big matrix equation again, can I kind of just, you know, turn the crank a little bit and obtain my optimal solution without having to go through all the matrix solving, right? And so that's a kind of a nice um, numerical thing to want to do because solving these large numerical systems could get computationally complicated, right? So the more, you know, computational juice I can squeeze out of an efficient algorithm, the, the better I should be. And so that's kind of where I want to go next is how do I kind of bootstrap my way from a shorter prediction filter to a longer prediction filter? Okay. So I apologize that this, this lecture has been kind of messy, right? This is kind of where the rubber hits the road in terms of having, you know, lots of matrices and lots of vectors, but this is the way the DSP gets as you get deeper into it. Um, okay, but that's the big picture is what I want to do is I want to say, okay, I have a length m vector here. Now I want to find out what is the best length m plus 1 vector, for example. Okay, and this whole process is called um, the Levinson-Durbin equation. So that's kind of where we're going. So let me just write that down. So.
So the idea is, how can we um, take the optimal length M predictor and easily determine the optimal length n plus 1 predictor. Okay. So what you're going to see here is basically fundamentally just kind of like some slick linear algebra manipulations is what we're measuring now. Okay. So where did I end up with? I ended up with a system like this. Okay. I'm going to just denote this by star. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I am going to label this vector here A sub M. Okay. That's like going to be the vector stuff that I need for a length M predictor. It contains these M filter coefficients and an extra one on the side. Okay, so if I write that in this way, so if I say that if I write A sub M is equal to one minus H hat, where this is the length M uh, optimal filter, Then what I just found out with these previous equations was telling me that I have this kind of situation. This is just a fancy way or a different way of rewriting this. Right? That's like saying that when I'm in the top case, right, what I have is that I am multiplying 1 by this r. Well, I'm multiplying a sub m times this vector, and I get this scalar j. Otherwise, I'm multiplying a sub m times this vector, and I'm getting 0, right? So this is just a different way of writing those matrix equations. And so, what's kind of um, let me just let me just pause for a second and say, okay, so the way of doing this bootstrapping from length m to n plus one, here what I'm doing is I'm taking the previous n coefficients and I'm predicting the next one, right? That's called prediction, right? I can also look at backward, uh, kind of so-called backward prediction, which is what we call smoothing, right? So. Um, Related to this, in just a second, is to say um, if we chose d of n equals x of n minus m and predicted this from the samples x of n x of n minus 1, x of n minus m minus 1. This would be a similar problem, which I would call smoothing, or sometimes it's here that's called backwards prediction. So this is just kind of a sidebar to say, well, what I could do is I could use the you know, previous n values to predict my next one, or I could use the previous n values to predict the one before that. right? So it seems like those two problems should be kind of symmetric in some sense. right? I'm in both cases using uh, m values to predict the one on either side. And so it seems like I shouldn't really be able to do any better predicting the future value than I should be able to do predicting the previous value, right? Because I'm kind of assuming that those that the signal is 
is stationary. And so let me just say that Wiener-Hopf in this case gives a kind of a similar looking system for the optimal filter, which I'm going to call G. And that similar looking filter is basically the following. So in the forward prediction case, what I discovered was this guy. I basically have this guy times my filter coefficients gives me these guys. The backward prediction turns out to give me something that looks very similar. Gives me the same matrix R. It gives me if these are the coefficients that I want. It turns out that the only thing that changes is that I flip this vector here. So basically, this is just the flipped upside down version of this. And if you think about how these things are all related, that kind of makes sense. And it turns out that if I think about how the two filters are related, all I'm doing is the optimal, uh, the optimal G's are just going to be the optimal H's flipped backwards, right? So consequently, um, so the optimal G's are just the flipped versions of the optimal H's. One way to think about that is it's saying that G of K is like H of M plus 1 minus K. That's like saying that, you know, G of 0 is H of M plus 1, G of M plus 1 is H of, or G of 1 is H of M, G of M is H of 1, and so on. So all I'm doing is I'm flipping the filter back and forth. So it's easy to get the backwards predictor from the forwards predictor just by reversing the order. And the J hat, which is the best achievable error, or the best expected error, is exactly the same. All this means is that you know, I can't do any better using m values to predict the one on the front than I can do as with using m values to predict the one on the back. Right? So in some sense, you know, as long as I'm the same distance away from my m values, I can't really change anything and the two filters are very related, which I think makes a lot of sense. Okay. And so now let's talk about how do I use this information and my desire to predict the new best M. How do I, do that? what I want to do is I want to say I've got a length M filter. I want to get a best length M plus one filter from that filter. How do I do that? Okay. So here is this Levinson-Durbin algorithm. So going back to the idea of um, so use the optimal filter of order M to obtain the optimal filter filter of 
order n plus 1. OK. So this algorithm is going to be very computationally efficient. OK. So here's the basic idea. So the optimal AM can be um, updated from the optimal AM minus 1 as follows. So I have, this is my new filter. This is my old filter. OK, and so what are these things? So here, this is basically a length m vector. This is a one by one scalar. This is a scalar called the reflection coefficient. And this is just a flipped over version of the guys here. So here I'm kind of using this D as a notation for the flip. So this basically is going to be like the um, best backwards prediction. And this is going to be the best forward prediction. OK. So let me write down a little bit more about how this works and what this means. And how do I get this mysterious scalar value? Okay. So in scalar form, what this is saying is that To get the kth element of AM, what I do is I take the kth element of AM minus 1 and I add to it basically what I get by flipping around this thing and multiplying it by a scalar. And in order to do this, I need to have some kind of boundary conditions that says that if I ever ask about this thing or this thing, I guess this thing is equal to 1, and this thing is equal to 0. OK. All right, I'm going to slog through this last part of it. This is a little bit tedious, but you don't actually have to know. Well, so let me, let me slog through it, and I'll get to the final result that lets you know how to do this whole thing in a recursive way. The main thing that you need to know now is, how do I compute this mysterious reflection coefficient scalar here? Okay. So now the question is, what is this gamma of m reflection coefficient at each point? OK. Well, let's find out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, this system here, which I'm kind of stating as fact, and figure out why it's true. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this whole thing by the autocorrelation matrix. Okay. So I'm going to take this thing. 
which is basically the Levinson-Durbin system. I'm going to multiply both sides of this by a big autocorrelation matrix. So I have this on the left, and then I have this on the right. OK. So let's think about what happens to this guy. What's this thing? Well, let's write out what this means. So this is basically a large autocorrelation matrix. And AM, I define this as 1 times, or 1 over the optimal filter of length M. And so when I multiply these two things together, this is just nothing more than the Wiener Hopf equations, where I have this is the best error that I can get at, with M taps and 0. Okay. So here, this is a scalar. This is like the best error with m taps. And this here is a length m plus 1, 0 vector. I guess it's just length, length m, 0 vector. Okay, so that's this side. That was pretty easy. Now let's think about what happens here. This is actually going to be kind of similar. So what I have is the first term of the right-hand side. I have this R m plus 1 times A m minus 1, 0. And again, what I'm going to do is write this as follows. I'm going to say this here looks like a big autocorrelation matrix here. And then this is going to be like right, all this vector here is is basically a vector that looks like Rm through R1, right? That's like saying I flip this vector, instead of going from 1 to m, I flip it from going to m to 1, right? So it's just a different way of writing this big matrix. Then I multiply it by this thing. If I figure out what this means, this is like saying I have Rm times Am minus 1, this is 0, and then I have Rm backwards transpose a m minus 1. So here, this is exactly the same thing that I got over here, just one order less, right? So this whole thing at the top is just going to be the best error that I could do at time m minus 1, a bunch of zeros. And then this number here is just going to be something I'm going to call delta m minus 1. This is just basically, you know, a scalar. This is also a scalar. And this is a vector of zeros. So this turned out to be also pretty straightforward. And I can show that the second term of the right-hand side is basically this thing flipped over. And so what I have in the end is a relatively simple set of equations. So here what I have in conclusion is that this gamma must satisfy 
on the left-hand side, I have the best I can do at m and a vector of zeros. On the right-hand side, I have this thing, zeros, this delta, plus this thing, this delta, zeros, this j. And so the first equation tells me that the error gets updated by this formula. Then I have a bunch of zeros in the middle. And then the last equation tells me that I have 0 equals this thing plus this. And so this tells me how to get my gamma from previous values of delta and j. And so now this tells me how to actually get the final <coughs> system, right? So the final recursion that I do to figure out what is the thing I want to uh, compute is so the final recursion. And this is really all I need to know to actually make it work. So I start off by initializing. This is the error at 0. This is what I define my delta at 0 to be. And then I say for m equals 1 to m, I define my reflection coefficient like this. I define my new best error. as this. I update my delta as something related to my previous a's. And I update my a's like this. Right, so this is basically a very simple recursion where I say, okay, I start with some base values for the best cost and this, this delta based on the autocorrelation. And then I'm kind of constantly making my new length m optimal filter based on this simple set of combining these scalar values. And the way I get the new filter is simply by taking the old filter and adding a zero to the end of it plus the scalar times flipping this vector around, right? So this is actually a very efficient way to turn the crank to get the next best filter. And it doesn't require me to solve any really complicated linear systems, right? So you can see that I took this Wiener-Hopf equation that used to involve this inverse of the autocorrelation matrix and turned it into this thing where it's just kind of like this very simple thing that involves scalars and flipping vectors around, right? So this is actually pretty efficient. And this is the way that you would probably see it implemented inside MATLAB. And so I think that if you look in MATLAB, you will find a Levinson-Durbin algorithm that will also produce for you these gammas and deltas if you needed them. OK. OK. So I know this is a pretty mathy lecture to come back to for both of us, um, but I'm, I wanted to get through it. So basically, this is kind of like the basic idea of optimal filtering. So even if your uh, desired signal is not one of the original signals, you can use the same kind of Wiener-Hopf theory to figure out what are the best filter coefficients I should have. Right? So the thing I want to talk about next time is a different way of thinking about computationally solving these kinds of problems. It's actually, the more you get into DSP, the more that you'll learn that there are courses like computational optimization and numerical linear algebra. You may see those in your applied math catalog that are very related to kind of modern DSP. And so it's worth taking a look at those classes, too. OK, so I'm just about at time, or maybe a little bit over time. So I'm going to stop my recording here.